Don Crabtree, a modern flint worker, observed that some prehistoric tools differed in color and texture from their local sources. Crabtree reasoned that such changes might have been deliberate, so he experimented with heat treatment as he set about making replicas of specimens found at archaeological sites. found that a fire pit lined with rocks and earth will slowly raise the temperature of flint-like materials to about 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Rapid changes of temperature or excessive heat in the heat treating process will crack and check the lithic material. So the earth oven is allowed to gradually cool for about 24 hours before it is uncovered. To measure the effect of the heat treatment, flakes are struck from cores and put in the oven. Highly siliceous rocks in their natural state are granular. By heat treating, the material may be altered to make it more glassy and easier to work. It will respond better to both percussion and pressure. Flaws are eased and internal strains are relieved. Flakes are much sharper because of the reduction of crystal size the individual rocks, even though from the same quarry or the same piece, uh, sometimes require different types of heat treatment. Sometimes the treatment has to last for a longer period of time. Sometimes higher temperatures are needed to alter the material. Naturally, the larger the pieces are, the more slowly they must be heated and cooled. The material is tested individually, and the difference in the material is shown after a fresh flake has been removed from the outside, the exterior is not altered. It still retains its original texture. The material then can be checked with the original piece and shown the differences between the heated and the untreated material. There are occasionally uh, certain minerals contained within the specimen that cause a change of color. Color change can also be diagnostic in knowing whether the material has been heated or is in its natural state. When the flakes are removed, they can be fitted to the rocks from which they were detached. Nevada Chalcedony. Don Prasini Flint. English Flint. California Chalcedony. Changes may be seen in color and texture, but some rocks do not show the changes that have taken place. Almost all specimens are easier to flake after they've been heat treated because the grain size has been reduced. The making of fluted points between 12,000 and 8,000 years ago in North America may have been closely related to the development of the heating process. Clovis points show a wide range of techniques and materials. This one shows evenly spaced right angle flakes removed from the margins. It would suggest heat treatment, but all of the original surface has been removed. Had there been one facet left of the original material prior to heat treatment, it would have shown us definitely that the material had been heat treated because the surface would still retain its original texture. If you'll notice the size of the objects being shown, these are all from the Simon site in Idaho. Another point from another site, also of the, the Clovis tradition. It is a method of basal thinning. 
there are differences in the way that the basal thinning is done, some by removal of several channel flakes, others by single channel flakes. Some are pressure flaked, and most are pressure retouched along the margins. The bases are ground, and in some cases, both faces have been polished and smoothed. Pressure flaking has taken place in this case, and it has all been pressure retouched on all margins in all faces, as well as basal thinning. The size is quite variable from this very small Clovis point, fluted from the base to the tip. A heat-treated primary flake of quartzite detached from a core is used for making a Clovis point. A cone or bulb of force takes shape when a blow is struck on a core surface, detaching a flake which carries away part of the striking platform. This bulb must be removed to thin one end of the flake. stone is used to remove larger flakes, thinning the object and straightening its edges. New platforms are made as control surfaces for taking off regular flakes. Sampler billet removes flatter flakes from the object and reduces the shattering which might occur with a stone hammer as the artifact is reduced in size. The billet diffuses the force so the cone formed by the blow spreads and a thinner flake can be taken off. This also leaves a sharper edge. Removing a flake produces fine debris which settles after the flake falls away from the specimen. Blows are directed at platforms over projections on the edge, so the flake tends to follow a ridge on the underside. The thickness of the ridge controls the width of the flake, and its margins terminate on previous flake scars on both sides of the ridge. The size of the flake, therefore, is related to the size and surface of each previous flake scar, provided the control is good. The object is now being thinned by the use of a percussor along the margins. The thinning flakes are very distinctive because they have to have a very small platform. The edge is, of course, made regular. And it must be made regular in order to take precision flakes along the margins. This time, the preparation of the platform is taking place and the thinning is progressing. A platform is prepared on the base for removing a flute on one face. After polishing the tip, the artifact is rested on a leather-covered anvil to reduce end shock and prevent shearing of the tip by the channel flake. Since the platform is taken off with the flake, it's necessary to make a new platform before the opposite face of the point can be fluted. A flute can be removed by direct percussion. A channel flake will collapse if the blow is not hard enough to carry the flute to its proposed termination. Instead, it breaks off in a step fracture.
because there's too much mass ahead and the detaching flake is compressed beyond its elastic limits. The channel flake is terminated in a hinge fracture. Had it carried further, it may have removed the other end of the projectile point. The point is intentionally made thick and biconvex. The flakes terminate along the midline. The base is constricted slightly. The Folsom followed the Clovis point, a step forward in flintworking technique and time. In replicating the Folsom point, preforming by pressure is concentrated on the curve of the cross section so that each face is symmetrical. This regulates the width of the channel flakes which will be taken off the two faces of the point, carrying nearly to its tip. Symmetry maintains the width of the channel flakes as each is removed. A flatter cross section increases the width of the flake, while a steeper lenticular cross section narrows its width. A platform is made by pressing flakes off from one face to bevel the base, moving the edge into line with the face to be fluted. The basal edge is flaked to isolate a projection with a triangular cross section. On the face to be fluted, the flakes get longer from each edge as flaking progresses toward the center. Two diagonal flakes are then removed at the base of the platform on the opposite face. Minute flakes pressed off along the edge leave finely spaced denticulate cutting edges. To accomplish this, the flint worker sets small platforms in line with diagonal parallel ridges. He applies pressure inward and downward to remove slender curving flakes from the underside of the point. The tip of the point is beveled to strengthen it and provide clearance and support for the fluting. Flaking at the tip bevels the face to be fluted. This makes a ridge at the tip which will intersect the detaching channel flake and keeps the tip from being sheared. The tip and the platform finally are polished for added strength. Preforms are ready for fluting. A fulsum preform is tilted forward in the vise with its tip resting on an antler anvil. The edges must be straight and parallel at the point of contact with the vise to prevent rolling when a channel flake is removed. A copper-tipped punch is seated on the striking platform. A blow is struck on the wood end of the punch with an antler billet. The punch must be in line with the center of the artifact and the vise, but is leaned back about 10 degrees from the face of the preform. The point is placed very carefully on the projection which acts as a platform, causing the channel flake to be sheared from the body of the artifact towards the tip. It should terminate at the tip and thin the point from the base to the tip. This is a good replica of a Folsom flute. Chest crutch or staff may be used to press off a channel flake. The knees and arms are used with the weight of the torso to press down and out. The 
channel flake has spread, but fortunately stopped short of the tip. Such a case happened aboriginally a number of times. The platform has been carried away, so a new platform must be made for fluting the other face. Flaking moves the basal ridge in line with the unfluted face. A projection is made in the center of the base and polished. The tip of the pressure tool is also seated on the polished platform and the flake expands before it reaches the distal end of the artifact. Such things happened aboriginally as well as in this experiment. Fortunately, it didn't remove the tip of the projectile point itself. Removing the second channel flake is more difficult because so much material has been carried away by the first channel flake. The base is an aboriginal point and the point made by the experiment have knife edges for the removal of channel flakes on both sides or both faces provided a very fine means for hafting. The symmetrical fluting on both sides of the Folsom point reveals a refinement of earlier fluting techniques as demonstrated by Crabtree's replica on the right. Prehistoric Cumberland points were large with very long flutes or channel flakes. The point is also thick, and the preparation of the platform is much different from platform preparation in Clovis and Folsom points. The platform is similar to the one prepared on Mesoamerican polyhedral cores used for making blades. The blade differs in appearance, but not in the technique used for detaching the Cumberland channel flake. The platform is prepared on the base at right angles to the long axis of the points. In this way, only a single platform is required for the removal of both channel flakes. The width of the channel flake is determined by the shape and symmetry of the cross-section and is similar to the Folsom point in this respect. The final retouch of the Cumberland point is retouched by pressure flaking diagonally from one margin to the other, curving the flakes past the center. Examination of the pressure flakes removed shows the extent of the flakes, similarity to blades. The platforms are very small. The artifact is reduced by several stages of flaking, showing diagonal pressure retouch on both faces. The lenticular cross-section is gained by diagonal parallel pressure flaking, with flakes following ridges. Each flake overlaps the scar of the preceding flake, so the ridges are closely spaced. The broad, flat platform of the Cumberland point indicates that less force is required to detach a channel flake than in the Folsom point. Several examples and styles of the Cumberland point showing the have very thick bases. They were prepared by using a flat platform rather than a projection. Uh, some are eared points. There is some variety in the retouch flaking. The ideal is to have the flake to terminate at the tip, but many terminated slightly short of the tip in a step fracture. The Clovis point is characterized by 
a platform isolation to remove the channel by direct percussion. The Cumberland point has a flat platform surface so that two channels may be removed from both sides without re-altering the base. The Folsom point platform has been polished and isolated. A very fine, minute, marginal retouch flaking is characteristic of the Folsom point. These points are similar in their flutes and great age, but the techniques for replicating them differ. Folsom points reveal an era of fine tool making never again equaled in the manufacture of New World projects.